So my name is Helen Chen. I'm a, the moderator for this session. I'm delighted to welcome all of you here and also my good friend and colleague, Amy Shachin. Shakino. Uh, okay, good, good. Um, and this is a workshop that I've seen her give before. It is excellent, you know, and it is this opportunity that we have to be able to think about, you know, we heard the great students speak during the, the panel. So how do we get some of that? You know, where can we start in terms of really thinking about building out our own professional e-portfolio? And um, Amy actually has a wonderful process uh, to help inspire and support us, you know, um, in, in doing just that. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Amy to go ahead and get us started. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, as Helen said, my name is Amy Shakino. I'm currently Associate Director for the Center of Teaching and Learning Excellence at Embry-Riddle um, in Daytona Beach, Florida. And so, um, yeah, today I, I really want to start with a sense of gratitude. It is summer here. I know a lot of you are probably off contract um, or you're, you're at the time of year where you can actually take a breath and clear your inbox. And so I'm, I'm so grateful that you've chosen to spend some time with me in that, in that lull. Um, and I hope that this will be a nice opportunity for you to think about yourself and to sort of practice some self-care and identity work for you in this conference space. So uh, there are some materials for today. I'm gonna go ahead and drop that in the chat too. Um, but if you have a device that has a camera, you can also just point that camera at the QR code and you'll access the same folder. Um, what you'll find is a copy of the slides that you're seeing now, but then also a handout that is gonna kind of walk you through all of the activities. And so uh, if you are an organized mind, I am certainly an anxious organized person. It'll give you a space to type. It'll kind of give you a rundown of the major key uh, points um, and it can be a workspace for you. Uh, you can also just use any paper or um, your phone, any kind of note-taking space that you have on hand, um, but we will be kind of writing and working together today. I also wanted to give you my email. Uh, I'll go ahead and also just type that into the chat. Feel free to reach out to me after the workshop. Um, I'm always excited to talk about e-portfolios uh, and teaching and learning and uh, digital online literacies. So. So before we get started, I did want to just take a minute to kind of talk about how um, e-portfolio work intersects with inclusion um, and really to kind of set a tone for an inclusive environment today with you all. So the first thing I want to do is just acknowledge that whenever we do e-portfolio work, we engage with systems of privilege and vulnerability, right? We, we are talking about our identities, who we are as people. And so there are always going to be people in the room who feel very comfortable talking about themselves in a, a public facing space and others who do not, and that's okay. Um, it's also important that we realize uh, we don't all carry the same risk when it comes to talking about who we are in public spaces, right? There are, are groups of people, there are certain identities um, that historically have been um, marginalized. They faced bias and violence and so, I just wanna hold space for you that there is some vulnerability in today's work. And um, I just wanna let you know, this is a safe and judgment-free space. And so because we wanna have a diverse and inclusive environment, we're gonna encounter and welcome stories and experiences then, that are different from our own. Um, and so I ask that if you encounter something that feels really different, you ask questions and you seek clarification that's gonna help you reach an understanding and help you learn. Um, and that, you know, again, we'll respond to each other with affirmation and grace and positivity. And then finally, uh, you know, I, I think it's important to remember that as we talk about inclusive environments and inclusive practices in higher ed, we remind, remember that that includes us as well. And so um, I sort of think of this workshop as being a little bit of an inclusive act because it create space for us to kind of reflect and tell our stories. And we know that that opportunity doesn't always exist for us, especially with some of the labor issues that are happening in education right now. And so I just wanna pause and ask if anyone has any questions about those notes or if there's anything you kind of wanna add as it relates to your thoughts uh, related to inclusion in ePortfolio work today.
practicing the meaningful pause. If anything comes up, you can always add them to the chat. Um, we can always revisit the slide. So an overview, uh, what is the plan today? If you notice those, those bolded words, uh, we're gonna be doing a lot of activities. It's gonna mostly be us working together uh, with a little bit of me talking with you uh, for the introduction. Our introduction is going to include the major questions that I get asked whenever I work with faculty as a faculty developer, which is, uh, you know, why, why now? And you want me to do what? And so we're going to just start there. Um, then we'll actually develop some bits and pieces for our e-portfolio, uh, and we'll end with maybe looking ahead and creating somewhat of an action plan. Uh, remember, this is a workshop, not a presentation, and so you are welcome to be active in the chat, to interrupt with questions or comments. There are going to be opportunities where you're prompted to share if you feel comfortable. Uh, please lean in, right? Like your voice is super important in this process. Also, uh, I know some, some people have very strong feelings about cameras on, cameras off. I don't. I just want you to use the spaces you need. So feel free to turn your camera on and off. You can move around if you want. You can sit on the floor, stand up. If you need a break, that's fine. I uh, just want to affirm that we all learn differently and you're welcome to learn in a way that works best for you today. Uh, and then finally, uh, as I mentioned, you're welcome to kind of use the chat and unmute yourself. But if you do want to share anonymously, you can also direct message either uh, myself or Helen, and we'd be happy to share anonymously for you as well. Okay, so part one, why, why now, and you want me to do what? So uh, when thinking about why it's so important for us to consider our own e-portfolios in this moment, um, I came back to really what we've been experiencing the last three years, the pandemic. Uh, it's been, I think, a lot of trauma and burnout and just unpredictability for us. And I know that we're kind of continuing to experience the effects of the pandemic even now, right? We're continuing to feel like we're not in normal times. And that can be really grating. Um, and often I think people who are in positions like ours, we're often rushed, right? We, we need to get to the next thing. We need to get to the next semester, the next COVID protocol, the next learning modality. And so we don't just have moments to kind of pause and think, how has this experience changed me? Um, and I know that's you know kind of a heavy statement. I do feel like I've been professionally changed by the pandemic, and I hope that the pandemic has brought some permanent changes to how you see things um, and how we see things as a higher ed community. And so I want to just kind of start by resisting this idea that we're going to go back to who we were and how we did things in two, 2019 um, this fall. And so today is really meant to kind of create space for you to think about you, to think about your needs, what you've learned, who you are in this moment as an educator or an administrator, what you now value and where you'd like to go. And so to get at those goals, um, we're going to have a grounding concept today called professional brand. I first heard about brand from an amazing team at Auburn University, where I started my career after graduation. Um, and Megan Haskins, who's my former Auburn colleague and is well established in the ABLE community, she did a lot of work with Auburn students, getting them to think about their brand as a way to communicate what they had learned in higher ed uh, to their future employers. And so we're going to use brand too. Branding is a little bit of a complex topic as it relates to us, um, but I would argue that you do have a brand right now. You might not actively acknowledge it, you might not cultivate it, uh, but you have one. And that's because as a professional, you're already connected to things. You're connected to ideas, you're connected to local and professional organizations, you're connected to your students, to a community of other educators, to the e-portfolio community, you're connected now. Um, and so these connections are really represented by this first image. And so what a brand does is it takes that well-formed uh, connection and it curates them into an organized representation of what makes us who we are as professionals. 
This is a brand that we can more intentionally cultivate, and it can be really helpful in telling our stories to others, but also in reflecting on what we've accomplished and what we want to go on to do. And so the second image illustrates this more intentional brand development. And so here's kind of a short one sentence definition of your brand. It's your work, how you do your work, and what your work says about you to those who encounter it. And so again, just reminding you, you have these pieces already. You probably have a CV or a resume. You probably have service that you do, courses that you've developed and taught, presentations, publications that you've given, um, knowledge about teaching or in your content area. And so what we're gonna do today is think about how those pieces of us fit together to form a coherent message about who we are, what we do, and what we value. And I also just want to add, um, our brand is not this stagnant thing. As I mentioned, I, I feel like I've my brand has changed since the start of COVID. And so I'm going to kind of take the pressure off of you to create an evergreen brand for yourself, right? We're just going to, we're going to do a snapshot brand of who we are in this moment with the understanding that it's gonna flex and it's gonna adapt and it's gonna change. Okay, so last slide before we get into it, just what are some benefits of cultivating this brand? I think it allows us to better understand who we are and to better curate how we're represented in online spaces. This came up a little bit in the student panel, but if you Google yourself, all kinds of things come up, right? My rate, my professor comes up. Corsicle comes up. Um, these are things I cannot control. But what I can control is my brand and my story that I tell through my ePortfolio. The second thing is that it can be helpful in making connections between what often seems like very disparate areas of who we are. Sometimes our research doesn't feel connected to our teaching at all, or our service doesn't feel connected. And so this helps us kind of craft a, a story that we're telling. And then finally, I think a brand can be really helpful when you're thinking about whether or not it's worth your time and effort to approach new projects and responsibilities. And so with that said, uh, we're gonna take some time today to create professional brand statements. I will preface, I have a background in writing and so uh, I'm gonna get a little obnoxious writing teacher with you today. We're going to start just by listing. Lists are very accessible. We make them all the time. They are low pressure. They are low judgment. They are not even sentences. They are words and phrases. And so to kind of prompt our list, what I've done is I've prepared a few um, micro prompts that will ask you to write a really short amount as a way to generate initial ideas as items on a list. I'm going to give you 90 seconds for each of the five prompts but I will, I will clue you in on a secret. All of the prompts are on that handout that I linked you to. In fact, I can drop the link again in the chat. And so if you uh, are a little stressed by time writing, you can open that handout and you can spend as, as much or as little time on those uh, prompts as you'd like. It's okay if we don't get to all of the prompts. If okay, it's okay if you hit a prompt and you're just totally stumped. Uh, we're just making some light lists today. So I want to pause and just ask if you have any questions before we get started. First prompt, identify at least two values that you hope to find you as an educator, administrator, or professional. Okay, whatever you're writing, I'm going to ask that you stop. Did the 90 seconds feel okay? Do you want a little more time or you feel good? Feel good? Okay. Again, fragments are fine. No one's checking anyone's spelling or grammar. Prompt two. Identify at least two experiences that have significantly impacted you as a professional. And these can be any kind of experience teaching experiences, service experiences, admin, research, networking, whatever you like. Uh, 
Okay, next. Identify at least two things that you've learned about yourself or about the work you do since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, identify at least two ways you wanna to continue to grow in your professional life. Last list. Identify at least two essential aspects of your job. So that what I mean by that is the parts of your job description that you feel are most important and you get to decide most important to you, to your students, to your employer, you choose there. Okay. Woo. You did the thing. Um, this is the moment where I like to just take a moment and look at my beautiful list and celebrate myself, right? Like 10 minutes ago, y'all didn't have anything written down. And now look at how many things you have. Um, so from here, of course, uh, we do not have a brand statement. We have to kind of continue to do more. Uh, and so if you're just joining us, what we've done is we've created a list using the prompts that are linked uh, in the materials that I just dropped into the chat. And so you're welcome to go ahead and open those up and you can kind of quickly fill out the list yourselves. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to look across our lists and you're welcome to do this work on your individual workspace or you're welcome to share the themes that you see in the chat, whichever you feel most comfortable with. But I'm curious to know, when you look across those items, what stands out to you as most important or most impactful or most meaningful to you as they relate to your professional goals and values? And so I'm going to give you just three minutes to kind of look across your list. Okay, so I just want to invite, but not require in any way, um, you all to share what you saw, what you noticed, and you're welcome to use the chat or you're welcome to unmute yourself and just speak, whichever you prefer. I can speak, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> if you like. Um, so, so kind of what I've seen quite a bit um, for me in, in my current role and has already been for a while now is that um, they, they are kind of two, two sides. So one is the, the leadership side in terms of leading the team, leading the product development. And then on the other side, there's also support. So supporting the community and then as leader in the team, supporting the team with their professional development. Um, and so I don't see it as two, kind of two sides or a continuum because they, they are very intertwined for me. Um, so it's not one or the other or this one, but also this one, but more like an end. Um, but yeah, oftentimes kind of not really seen, I think, on, on the same coin there. I love, I love that you've talked about how this is intertwined work that you're doing, because sometimes it feels like we're wearing hats, right? Like that's a, a metaphor we hear often, like, oh, now I have my department chair hat on or my teacher hat. Um, and so I love that you see how these parts of you are already related and intertwined. Thank you for sharing. Um, JW says mentoring and uh, innovation. Oh, I love those. Meg says an emphasis on building an inclusive infrastructure um, and inviting new practitioners to it and then equipping them with tools and other kinds of knowledge. Meg, you're, you're well on your way to a brand statement. You're, you're, you've got it. You're rolling down the hill on that goal. Does anyone else want to share before we draft our statements? Okay, so what we're going to do, and I'm going to show you an example, because um, I know a model is sometimes helpful. We're going to compose a one to two sentence brand statement that addresses those themes 
in addition to considering your professional goals moving forward. And so I'm going to show you the one um, that I drafted for myself when I piloted this workshop by myself. Um, and so something you might not know, I've, I've recently switched positions over the summer um, and I moved into a faculty developer role in a center for teaching and learning excellence. And so this is a different brand statement than what um, I had, I think when Helen <laughs> and I uh, delivered this workshop last, last year at the ABLE conference. And so my statement is, Amy Shikino is a highly collaborative and enthusiastic educational developer specializing in high impact practices and digitally enhanced teaching. From workshops to curriculum redesign, Amy wants to help educators feel more confident and joyful about the work they do. And so, right, it's brief, it kind of captures some of the important themes that I had written down, um, and it gets at what I want to do with my professional life, my like future professional focus. Any questions, or do you wanna talk any more about the drafting process before I give you a few minutes to draft? Amy, I had a quick question. I mean, so with something like this, that it's so concise and, you know, um, like is the choice of words, or maybe we're not at that state. Like, you know, when you like specifically what you choose and like joyful, calm, you know, that kind of thing, like, does that come later? Or like, what's, what's that part of the, the writing process? So I think it depends on cognitively where you want to put your, put your muscle, right? Like, okay. You might just want to focus on, on ideas. Um, I think that's how a lot of us write first drafts, and that's fine. And you're going to have to, we talk about the selection process in e-portfolio making, right? You're going to have to make a selection from some of the items on your list, right? Like not everything can go in. Um, but some of us like to think about words at this stage too. And so if you want to play wordsmith and sort of tinker and, and think about the most effective words, I think that's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, mm -hmm. I would say don't, Put, put pressure on yourself to create the first pancake, right? It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, we're just getting it in the pan. Great. Thanks, Amy. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to give you five minutes to do this. Um, would you like to look at the directions or do you want me to leave the example up? I say the example. Example, please. Oh, okay. Yeah, typically what happens at this part of the workshop is I mute myself and they say, no, 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 go back. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Okay, five minutes. I'll let you know when we have about 30 seconds left. Okay, so I'm going to stop you. Um, again, just a moment to make space to recognize at the top of the hour, you maybe didn't know what brand was, and now you have a first draft of a brand statement. Pretty productive of you. Um, I Again, just I want to invite anyone who feels like they're ready to share a first draft. Um, understanding every first draft is perfect because all it has to do is exist. Um, either by typing it into the chat or, you know, sharing it verbally with us. No pressure. Oh, great. So we have, uh, Meg has been brave enough to share in the chat. Thank you. Margaret Smith is a medieval historian and digital humanist whose research and pedagogical interests center on infrastructure, collaboration, and community building. She seeks to build inclusive infrastructures for scholarship and teaching that actively invite new practitioners and equip them with the tools, knowledge, and community support that will support them. That is awesome. There is a lot packed into that statement. Yeah, great one. Does anyone else want to share? And I'll say we're, we're among friends. So if you see a particular strategy being used in someone's brand statement, uh, feel free to you know borrow that, that writing strategy. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, that was a great example. But again, right? Everyone, everyone's first draft is great because it is something that exists. I don't know about that, Amy. I feel like mine should just be, oops, I'm a perfectionist and I'll never get this written. <laughs> well, Anne Lamont has that essay. It's called um, 
it's called shitty first drafts and it's actually something I assign in when I teach composition and so it's very natural part of the writing process but uh, I have a feeling all of your drafts are really great because you're very accomplished professionals. I think you're maybe being a little hard on yourself. Um, so Alex says, from designing and leading workshops for teachers to utilizing data to understand and tackle messy problems, Alex Guth is a curious, creative, and a holistic thinker with a background in geology and academic policy. She enjoys working independently to take deep dives on projects but values the shared expertise of collaborative work. Ooh, I love that one. That is great. JW, uh, JW Turner is a caring, innovative educator committed to promoting student success through meaningful experiences with music. JW hopes to empower students to use the music in their lives to enhance their strengths and become who they are. JW, that's really good. Again, the fact that y'all wrote these in five minutes, I mean, really, really good. <laughs> okay, Christina. Christina Hoffner is a professional uh, who thrives in environments that require a broad set of skills and flexibility to work in multiple contexts. She's continuously learning to lead people and projects as well as support colleagues and clients alike in their professional journeys as well as project, uh, project needs. These are so good. I always get chills when I read them. <laughs> Sorry, such a such a writing teacher. So um, step four, which we're not going to do, this is kind of your your homework, um, is after you've gotten your brand statement to a place where you're happy with it, uh, what you might do is revisit your CV or your dossier or, you know, really kind of whatever summarizes your work. And you might just think about whether or not your brand aligns with what you're currently pouring your time and labor into. And if it doesn't align, I would suggest one of two things. Um, one, reassess and revise your brand statement, right? That's the nice thing about words. You can change them. Um, or two, maybe start thinking about reassessing what you're, you're putting your time and energy into. And just to illustrate that point, um, I wanted to show you this Venn diagram. So uh, this represents how educators can identify whether projects or roles land in what's called your brand sweet spot. And that it exists at the intersection of what you're passionate about, what you're skilled at, and what your institution needs. And so note, there are really uh, significant risks when something addresses only two of the three domains. So if we do things that we're passionate about, uh, and our institution needs, but we're not very good at, we risk maybe having some, some poor job performance. But if we do something that we're very good at and our institution needs, but we don't feel passionately about, we're at risk for burnout. And then finally, if we do something that we're passionate about and we're skilled at, but it's not really seen or needed, um, we might risk kind of sectioning that part of our professional lives off as a hobby or a pet project. And so what we really want ideally, is for something to touch all three areas of our lives. And so uh, this sort of ends part two, which is the focus on brands. And we're going to move here into exploring some example e-portfolios from folks in higher ed. I guess before we do that, um, I just want to pause and ask if you have any questions about brand statement, um, or if you want to talk any more about brand before we kind of move into e-portfolios. Oh, and Christina's added in the chat, there's been research on how much of our daily job needs to be fulfilling, needs to make us happy, um, and it's only about 20%. Wow. Okay, so let's talk about e-portfolios. So um, I'm assuming everyone knows what an e-portfolio is because you're here. And so I'm not going to do the what is an e-portfolio spiel. Um, so we're going to jump right into looking at a few examples. And so I've identified just a few examples from administrators and educators in higher ed. And in, in just a minute, I'm going to put the links into the chat and I'll also project them here. They're also on that, that worksheet that you link to. Um, and I'm going to give you about 10 minutes to explore the example of your choosing. And so what I'm really interested in are these four questions. One, 
who do you think this person is? So kind of like, right, what's their brand? Two, what do they value as a teacher or administrator or scholar or professional? Three, how is this e-portfolio like and unlike a CV? And four, what was your experience reading this e-portfolio? And so the examples that I've chosen, I think I'm gonna have to get out and get back in to copy. Just drop them in the chat. Go ahead and share my PowerPoint again. Did that go back to what I'd like it to? Or are you seeing the list of the links? Good, okay. Yes. <laughs> So uh, there are some examples from different disciplines, geosciences, um, an instructor in GTA, so a graduate level focus, uh, digital writing and cultural rhetorics, human studies, um, feminist studies and critical race and ethnic studies, uh, our own Megan Mize, I'm sharing with permission, who is the director of ePortfolio and digital initiatives, um, English, and an educational developer. And so I ask that you just choose whichever one you want and you can click around if you'd like um, and that you just take a few minutes to explore and answer those four questions. And so I'm gonna go ahead and go back to the questions since the links are also in the chat and I'll uh, bother you again in 10 minutes. Okay, so I went ahead and I just dropped those questions into the chat so they're easy to refer back to. Um, I'd love for us to go ahead and talk about some of these e-portfolios. I have them all pulled up here. Please let me know if you're not seeing them because I need to fix my screen share. Um, again, before we discuss, just a reminder uh, about our kind of inclusion ground rules that we started with. We want to make sure that we're not judging these e-portfolios. We might not be the audience for these e-portfolios. These, e these are hopefully continuing to be developed and, and flexing with the identity of their creators. Um, and so we're really just looking to kind of affirm and praise and validate experiences that are different from ours. So I'd love to know what you looked at, what you saw, what you noticed. I could go. Yeah, thank you. I hope it's okay. I'm gonna say my person is a badass. Yeah, who did you look at? Uh, Megan Meads. Oh yeah, Megan is a badass. That's the perfect description. Um, I love that she included music. She has a little, um, I don't know her, so. Um, uh, but I'd like to. Uh, so I like that she included music. I thought that really, um, I think if you go to the about page um, and scroll down, there's like three little clips and it's not necessarily, she describes, it's not her favorite. Um, it, it is just kind of setting a mood and I think making it really fun to interact. Yes, please. Please, Helen, I would love to meet her. Um, I love that she included that. I also really liked, I'm going to do this, I think. I have a performance evaluation due in about two weeks, and I think I'm just going to do it this way because I, I really like the way that you're able to look at um, the last year. It's right there. You can go back. So when you look at um, the tab is reflection, I think. No, yeah. Yes, and those are by year, which mm -hmm. like, look at that. Wow, it's amazing. Um, and anyway, it's beautiful, it's elegant, it's like packed with information and it's, um, I'm an art historian, so I love to be able to see all this information kind of um, organized in this way. And I know some of the um, folks in previous sessions were talking about how they think differently after creating, and I know folio thinking, right, does impact, but also just the way that you're able to arrange and organize, um, I thought was really effective. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And do you mind if I tell, if I tell Megan your, your one line takeaway, because that's going to bring her so much sunshine today. Please, absolutely. <laughs> so Alex says, um, I looked at Adams, let me go ahead and pull up Adams. Uh, and saw he used this part as part of his promotion file and happy uh, to see he's currently listed as a full professor. Yes, um, a lot of 
uh, institutions have started using e-portfolios, whether they mean e-portfolios like these examples or more of a repository e-portfolio um, as part of their promotion and evaluation process, which is awesome. Um, I will say that's not always the case. And so that is something to think about as you're, you're pouring your time and your labor into perhaps creating an e-portfolio is how it's gonna be recognized, seen and validated by communities that matter to you. And so that might include your institutional community. It might not, um, but just, you know, putting, putting a penny in the bank there on that one. Does anyone else wanna talk about what you've noticed in these e-portfolio examples? I think if you, a general thing is that because I, I guess it's because they are all public that they are more showcase portfolios or kind of expanding um, achievements that um, people have reached um, make kind of Megan also has her entire CV on it, which which definitely needs digging into into all of these um, publications over the years and also showing the versatility of them. And yeah, I think a couple of others were also used for promotion. So therefore, having that public persona and maybe less focusing on kind of a lot of the learnings, there's definitely always reflection in there, but it might not be the, the main point. Yeah, I'm so glad you pointed that out. And, you know, I think the way that we communicate to our audiences, they're going to look different depending on who we're talking to. And so, for instance, if you look at Amelia's, uh, who has a background in technical writing, it's very text heavy. Um, and that makes sense, right, given given this the disciplinary perspective and audience that we're talking to. But when we go to like Megan's, for example, who is a digital person um, with, with, I think, a background in like textuality, um, we see a lot more multimodality happening, um, multiple media. And so, yes, I, I think your e-portfolio can really take on a number of different um, final products. And I think also, right, some of these are fairly comprehensive, like Megan's is it's there's a lot in there. You could spend an afternoon with that portfolio, um, but they're not all as comprehensive. Some of them are much more brief, like I think uh, Laura's e-portfolio, which has her CV and then really just kind of some brief descriptions on each of these other areas. And so that's something I, I want to kind of encourage you to think about is you can start small. It can be a single landing page to begin with. It doesn't have to be a full folio um, right off the start. Um, just kind of speaking to some ideas in the chat. So Helen says Candace Reynolds, who's now at Boise State and formerly at Portland State, can also share her experiences creating ePortfolio as part of her PT process. Yes. And um, Candace, Heather Stewart, and there was someone else, they wrote about that experience in um, AEPR, right? I'll have to I'll have to find it for y'all, but it's it's a great read and it talks about the process. Um, Alex says, in general, I love seeing the aesthetic and design components that aren't there in a typical resume or CV. Absolutely, uh, Christina agrees. There are a lot of possibilities to show more of a personality without giving the binder to the recruitment agent. Yes, and you know where does that binder even go? It, it sits on your chair's desk for quite a while. I imagine it goes to your dean at some point, but that stack of papers, it eludes me. So it's nice that this is something you get to keep too. Yeah, and Amy, just to that point, I think what I work with faculty a lot creating their promotion portfolios. And one of the things I've seen both in paper and in a digital format is that list of accomplishments and stuff without any explanation or connection to the story the faculty member actually wants as someone who's sat on lots of committees wants to hear. And, and so I think going back to Christina's point, there, there, there's a balance that needs to be struck, I think, between, um, you know, especially if you're going for uh, a particular promotion type purpose, you want to showcase your achievements. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you should ignore the fact that all of us have have moments where it hasn't gone so well. I often get, you know, here's all my course evals. And I'm like, but why is there only a 20% response rate in this class? And how come they didn't like the class very much, but no explanation or connection to like, did I try a new assignment or did I, you know, what, what actually happened there? And, um, and that's one thing that I think all of us can work on is how do we tell that story 
to the audience for the purpose that we're we're designing it for. So that you know, I think with all these examples you showed, um, I have a really good sense of of each of the people and why they created the portfolio based on what what's in there as artifacts and also the story that they've told. Yeah, that is such an excellent point. And you know, um, not that our promotion reviewers aren't careful readers. I think many of them are, but there's there's a degree of separation that sometimes exists there, right? Like ABLE is a great example. If you tell someone I'm a part of ABLE, I attended their workshop, um, you know, many of them might read the acronym and then they might not know what, what that actually means without your further contextualization. So saying like, it's a community, a global community of ePortfolio practice. I participated in workshops. I learned about evidence-based practices and research. I applied what I learned into my courses through X, Y, and Z, right? Like creating that bridge between these experiences and how they um, speak to our value and our story is very, very important to stakeholders. Um, and I hope that they help us advocate for more visibility and more compensation and more recognition at our local institutions. Thank you for that, that thought. That's very, very important. Any other points before we move on? So last part of the workshop, next steps. And so this is gonna be the time where you really think about your needs and your wants um, as a potential ePortfolio creator. And again, um, I want to just remind you that you don't have to, the, there is no correct answer in this next stage. So you don't have to say, yes, I'm going to go home and create my ePortfolio. In fact, I'll start it tonight. Like we, we don't want that. We want to have just an honest conversation about what would, what would be meaningful and helpful for you. And for that, it might, it might just be the brand statement right now. And that's cool. Um, but I think that sometimes talking about what you'd like to do can be helpful in, in starting that action. And so what I've done is I've created a shared virtual space for us. So I'm gonna go ahead and just open it here. I'll drop it in the chat. Let me make sure I've given you permission to edit. I have, great. And so you're welcome to use this as your thinking space. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Helen dropped the link um, to that uh, ePortfolio article about um, the folks who built their own uh, faculty and staff e-portfolio. So check check that out. Add that to your, your many open browser tabs. So you're welcome to use this as a thinking space. Uh, you're also welcome to copy these questions into a private work document if you don't want to share your thoughts with us, and that's fine. Um, but you can go ahead and just claim a workspace by typing your name or your pseudonym or initials into the name tab. Um, and then you can just kind of, you know, space and type from there. Um, and so you'll find four questions in that document. One, where are you in the process? And it might just be like, hey, I just met this lady. She made me make a brand statement. That's, that's where I am. That's fine. Um, personally, I'm at a space where I have an e-portfolio, but I've, I've just made a career shift. And so I, what I need is really a new e-portfolio. And so just tell us where you're at in this moment. Uh, second question, what are three ideas from this workshop that you'd like to bring into your own professional development? What support do you need to do this work? And then finally, um, and I think the ABLE community is really interested in your answer to this, what's something that we could do? to support you as an ePortfolio creator. And so what I'd love to do is, is give you about maybe 10 minutes to kind of think about those four questions. And then the last thing that I have is discussion and Q&A. So uh, we'll, we'll take 10 minutes to write and then I'll uh, interrupt you. Okay, so before we move into kind of talking about your thoughts and ideas, I did want to share a resource that Christina mentioned in the doc and um, I put in the chat. ePortfolios Australia does have a plan, act, reflect, and ePortfolio time, uh, which are one and a half hour sessions intended to give you space to work on your ePortfolio. Christina, have you attended any of these? Uh, no, unfortunately not yet. The next one, I think, will be on the 9th of August, um, late afternoon, early evening for the States. 
Thank you. I was, I was like, oh gosh, we're going to have to do some tons of work. <laughs> My brow started to sweat there. Um, and so that's a great resource. Uh, I'd also love, we, we have Helen and Tracy with us right now. And so I'd, I'd actually love for us to spend our last 10 minutes, maybe talking about um, what ABLE might do to support us as we create e-portfolios. And there are some great ideas in the document. So please do uh, make sure to check that out, but we can also just talk it out for 10 minutes if that's okay. So one thing that was mentioned is there, there used to be a community of practice called Out of Practice. Could one of you maybe tell us a little bit about what that looked like and, and um, maybe if there's a potential to, to re-give uh, that new life? Helen and I both, both patiently wait for the other one to unmute. <laughs> Um, so it was a community of practice that was started um, many years ago by, I think, by mm -hmm. Gail Ring and Candace Reynolds. That's right. And others, maybe, but um, where we got together as a group of colleagues and worked on our portfolios together. So that's actually how I, I got to have my first um, portfolio. And we met and sort of were accountable to one another about um, what we were working on. We gave each other feedback and we had a regular kind of schedule of meetings, um, which really culminated in a conference presentation. So I don't know, Helen, do you, what do you want to add about that? Yeah. So the, um, the AEPR piece that uh, Amy mentioned really kind of represents some of those perspectives and it has sort of come back in a variety of forms since that original, uh, uh, cohort. And I think John, maybe JW maybe had participated in some, some discussions around that. No, I, I know we talked about it, so maybe that didn't happen. I mean, I think the, uh, the ePortfolios Australia model could be interesting where it's just like, here's a set time, come if you'd like, you know, and that might also provide an opportunity to look at examples of other people's portfolios. So I think that's certainly one way to get, you know, additional inspiration as you see different kinds of models, how people are approaching this. One other comment that was made uh, within the document or the action plan document is this question about platforms. You know, what kinds of platforms should, can we use? What's out there? Whether you go with something that your institution is already using, certainly institutional platforms is one thing. Platforms for more professional digital presence uh, are another. Um, and when I think about, well, Amy, I think your experience working with the students at Auburn, being platform agnostic, at least on that front. Um, Megan at uh, Old Dominion University, I think they had, uh, were kind of supporting, you know, WordPress and so on. Now, I think for those in more technical fields, it's GitHub is another option, uh, in addition to just the usual website building tools, Wix, Weebly, you know, all of those kinds of things. Currently, we don't have anything formal uh, that ABLE has put together, although always happy to have those conversations about choosing a platform, what are the considerations, you know, from free to freemium, you know, to actual uh, vendor-sponsored platforms. Amy, I don't know if you have more to add on that front. Just that um, I think the talking to someone about what the platform can do is really important. I think if technology is something that is kind of holding you back from starting this process, there are platforms, and I, I named Google Sites in the chat, that are essentially like plug and play. Like you can start a Google Sites, plug in some content, um, and be on your way uh, fairly quickly. Uh, you can't quite do you don't have the full freedom of design in Google Sites like you do in Wix or Weebly where you can physically move things and personalize them to, to an extensive degree. Um, and that's how I think you get like a Megan My ID portfolio. Um, mm -hmm. That wouldn't be possible in Google Sites. But again, understanding that we come from different work life experiences, um, we don't all need to have the Megan Meisey portfolio. We can't, mm -hmm. we can't all be badasses like Megan Meisey, <laughs> right? Um, we can still have solid e-portfolios um, that exist and are, are a reflect, uh, reflection of a healthy work-life balance for us. And so, mm -hmm. again, I, I think about what's meaningful for you. Several of you mentioned tenure and promotion or evaluation in the document. And so um, thinking about those criteria and if you need to use a particular platform, I know some some institutions like you to use their 
their repository system to create those ePortfolios. That's something that you might ask about at this stage in the process. Um, Christina mentioned uh, the field guide. Yep, that's a great resource. Um, but there's, there's no reason not to get started, even if it's just by creating an about me page. Yeah, and I think one thing that we're we're happy to do at ABLE is um, connect folks with others who could and are available to give them some feedback um, informally on their portfolios. Like I said earlier, in working with my colleagues here, it, you know, it, you know, just as somebody who's not in that other person's head, they thought they were being super clear about what their story and brand was and how their work connected to it. But for me, not in their head, it really didn't make sense. And so just having that short opportunity, I met with one faculty member for 30 minutes and, and sort of said, like, what does this mean? And what, and they said, wow, that was so helpful to just get that that outsider perspective. And, and that's true for all of us. We all can use that extra feedback. So, yeah. And Tracy mentioned how, um, you know, participating in this community of practice was how she got that first e-portfolio. That's a great idea. If you have people at your institution, people in this Zoom room um, who maybe are willing to just set up a standing meeting 30 minutes a week, an hour a week, an hour a month, right? Like whatever is a feasible amount for you um, where you all get together and you just have some time and space to work. And you have that, that moment on your calendar that says e-portfolio work time. Um, that's a great place to get started. In my list, I asked for an Amy to do a part two, part three, dot, dot, dot. No pressure, Amy. <laughs> Well, it's so funny. Um, Kat Mahaffey was in one of the other sessions uh, because she met Sarah and Megan and Morgan at Computers and Writing. And Kat's the president of another organization I'm involved with, GSOL, and they've been wanting to do some e-portfolio work too. And so maybe there's some, some good collaborative opportunities uh, where we can all kind of get together and e-portfolio it up. Yeah, that's a great point, Amy. I Similarly, I'm giving a, a talk at the SAMLA conference, which is the South Atlantic Modern Language Association, yeah, in November, and um, and we're planning as part of their president's session, some e-portfolio sessions. So look at your own professional, other professional organizations, and see if there's portfolio work happening, and if not, that's something that um, I'm sure there are lots of us at ABLE that are members of those organizations. We'd be happy to work with you to get something on, on the books to help you your other colleagues and, and you um, work with digital portfolios and if this presentation was helpful you have access to all of these materials so download them adapt them right do an iteration of this workshop at your institution or um, at at your own professional conference um, and you know just give able a shout out okay well, uh, Amy, any other sort of parting thoughts or? No, just thank you. Um, I appreciate your participation and your engagement. I will say um, the Google Doc, I'll be using the same Google Doc tomorrow in the same mm. iteration of this workshop. And so you're welcome to leave your information on that Google Doc. People are going to love opening that Doc and seeing that someone has written in it. But if you'd exactly. rather not, now would be a good time to kind of copy and move it into a Word doc on your desktop. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, please join me in thanking Amy for this really, again, a very practical and informative uh, workshop um, today. Again, I just want to mention that, you know, within this time slot, there were three options. And so these same workshops will be repeated tomorrow so that if you want to check out the assessment work, assessment equity workshop with Kevin Kelly, uh, as well as the assessment workshop with Terry Rhodes and Kathy Yancey, you'll have another opportunity to check those out tomorrow. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, again, we'll have a little break right now. And then at the uh, top of the hour, we'll bring the, uh, we'll kind of resume the next set of concurrent sessions.